Winston Churchill once said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. History is such an integral part of basic knowledge and helps our understanding of the world around us. Right now, the Manitoba Museum is presenting a fantastic and historically significant project called Hearts of Freedom, Stories of Southeast Asian Refugees. Focusing on the years 1975 to 1985, the exhibit tells the remarkable and often harrowing stories of refugees from Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia, and how they made their way to Canada, very often leaving family and possessions behind to eventually become an essential thread to the cultural fabric of the country today. And joining me here in the Classic 107 studio, I am joined by the curator of the Hearts of Freedom exhibit, Stephanie Petsomai Stobie, who is Associate Professor of Conflict and Resolution Studies at the Menno Simons College at the University of Winnipeg. She is also the President of the Canadian Association for Refugee and Forced Migration Studies. Hi, Stephanie. So nice to have you here in studio. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Mm-hmm. So as we, as I was saying uh, off air, there are a lot of layers uh, to this onion. Uh, before we get to the exhibit, I want to first talk about you. The creation of the exhibit must have been a real passion project for you. You are originally from Laos. Uh, your family came here to Canada when you were very young. I was watching a video that you made. You, know, you escaped across uh, the Mekong River to Thailand. And that itself could be its own story. I mean, you could literally write a book about that. It could be its own conversation and interview. But just for the purposes of time, can you talk us through the process of moving from the refugee camp in Thailand to how you came to Canada and specifically Winnipeg? Yeah, I think my own family story is, um, for me, very, very interesting. Uh, As you mentioned, our family crossed the Mekong River when I was about four years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, we escaped uh, across the Mekong River in a small canoe, and uh, there was uh, boulders that jut out of the waters, and we were very concerned about that. There were soldiers on both sides of the river, uh, the Thai soldiers telling us, uh, or or the Thai soldiers were told to shoot anyone trying to enter Thailand. The Lao soldiers were told to shoot anyone trying to leave. And so it was a very dangerous journey, uh, but somehow we managed to get across to Thailand uh, without being uh, detected. And uh, we uh, met up with a farmer in Thailand who saw us trying to escape across the Mekong River. And he uh, he and his family basically allowed us to sleep at uh, their place, you know, in a hut outside. And then the next day we walked for 12 hours to go to mm. a, uh, a camp. And uh, I think our parents, uh, my mom in particular, thought that when the communists left, that they would return back to Laos because they didn't want to leave in the first place. But that didn't happen. And so after a couple of years, then... We uh, were uh, uh, told that if we didn't go to a refugee camp, we might be sent back to Laos. Mm. And that's when our family decided to go to a refugee camp and claim uh, refugee status and see if we can be resettled in a third country. So we um, managed to uh, get to a refugee camp. But before that, we had to enter a detention center because Mm. the Thais said that we had entered their country illegally, even though international laws (laughs) say that you can cross borders and seek asylum in another country if you fear persecution. And uh, so we were put in a detention center and uh, for, for, I think, a week. And then from there, we were able to enter a refugee camp. And uh, in the refugee uh, camp, it's uh, you know it was a very poor refugee camp. It was one of the smaller ones. There mm-hmm. were no facilities. There's no tents, no buildings, not even running water at, at the camp. So basic hygiene is a yeah. serious issue. Yeah. yeah. So my parents had to actually build their own hut. So they went into the forest, cut down some mm-hmm. uh, bamboo uh, trees, and created or built a hut for us. And then for drinking water and for bathing, we would walk for miles to a creek and uh, we would get water from there, bring it, carry it back with us and boil it for drinking water at the refugee camp. And we would take our baths in the creek as well. So the situation wasn't great in terms of the uh, refugee camps. Food was rationed. We had only rice and salted fish, dried fish. 
And uh, so our parents were very worried about us being there. And we applied to different countries uh, to be resettled. We applied to France, Australia, United States, Canada, Hmm. and uh, all the countries accepted our application. We were a young family. We were all healthy. And uh, we chose to come to Canada because it was the first plane to arrive at the refugee camp to take us away from there. And our parents said, the first opportunity we can leave this camp, we should just take it. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and I think as we were leaving, my mom recalls the Americans were saying, where are you going? Why are you going to Canada? We were just about to come and get you. And you were sponsored to go to California. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But my mom said, no, you know, Canada came first and we're going going to come to Canada. And so uh, from what I understand, you landed in Montreal and then traveled to Manitoba, right? Yes. But it wasn't Winnipeg exactly like that you, where you started out. Yeah. It was more rural, rural yes. Manitoba, right? Yeah. So during that time, there were two reception centers, one in Edmonton, a Griesbach military base, and then one in a Montreal Long Point. And our family landed in Montreal and uh, they gave us winter clothing and uh, then found us sponsors here in Manitoba. And so we ended up coming to Manitoba and we arrived here in the middle of December <laughs> <laughs> to uh, minus 40 uh, when we were used to being in plus 40 degrees Celsius in Bangkok. And so that was an extreme shock for us. And uh, we didn't uh, live in, uh, I guess we arrived in Winnipeg, but then we got driven to a small community in southern Manitoba. Mm. And now you're a professor of conflict resolution. Was it these experiences as a child that made you want to go into conflict mm-hmm. resolution? Uh, and I, my understanding is you've done conflict resolution in Laos, like you've mm-hmm. gone back and done work there, right? Yes. I think when I was looking at university programs, somehow I have always been uh, interested in this topic and interested in looking at what are are other ways to resolve conflicts uh, other than through violence, uh, just because of my own family's experience with warfare and Mm -hmm. displacement, resettlement and settlement. I always wanted to look at peaceful ways to resolve conflicts, uh, nonviolent ways. And so I was always uh, gravitating towards these kinds of topics, uh, social justice, peace building, conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think it is a result of uh, my experience as a child going through warfare and having to flee and resettle in another country that I wanted to study this topic. And I went and I did, um, well, I have a, a PhD in peace and conflict studies. And mm. so that was my my focus. Mm. I want to turn to the Hearts of Freedom Stories of Southeast uh, Asian Refugees. Where did the idea for you, where did this come from? How did you decide to put this together? Yeah. So the project uh, began in 2018. Um, I and a team of researchers from Carleton University and uh, and others from the um, the Canadian Immigration Historical Society, we got together. So the five of us, uh, there's Michael Malloy, Peter Dushinsky, Alan uh, Moscovich, and Colleen Lundy and myself uh, got together and uh, started this uh, this project after we were contacted by the Vietnamese community who were very Mm. interested in documenting their history. And uh, so they uh, asked uh, the academics, researchers, if we can help them with this. And so it began with the Vietnamese community wanting to do that. And then um, us uh, researchers were able to get a research grant from Canadian Heritage. And we began our interviews in 2019. Mm. And the interviews continued until 2021. So we interviewed people from across Canada, from Vancouver to Halifax. And uh, then there was COVID. (laughs) So we had to stop interviewing uh, with uh, human subjects. And uh, we had to have a bit of a break. And then we got back to it again and finished up the last interviews in Halifax. And then our final interview was with former Prime Minister Joe Clark Uh in the summer of 2021. Wow. Yeah, I, mean, it's, I was sort of thinking when I was putting together the interview, how did you get the participants? Did you reach out to specific community cultural centers, for example? Mm-hmm. Like, And the other thing mm-hmm. is, how many how many people took part in the project? Mm-hmm. How many people, to- people told their story? 
Well, we interviewed, uh, well, we have 173 interviews. Wow. And some of those interviews, some people came as a couple, a husband, wife, or some people came as siblings. But uh, we had a total of 173 interviews across Canada. And these interviews were conducted in five different languages. We had English, French, Vietnamese, Khmer, and Laotian. Mm. So uh, we wanted uh, the people who were most comfortable speaking and sharing their stories in their own language to be able to do so. And this was made possible because we had researchers um, who speak the the language. For example, I speak Lao and Thai fluently. Mm -hmm. We had camera people and interviewers who were from the ethnic communities. So sometimes they would jump in and do simultaneous translation <laughs> during the uh, the interviews, and it was yeah it was an amazing amazing process in terms of being able to do this and conduct all of these interviews in five different languages. So you can see how complex it was. Yeah, yeah it sounds like a yeah. lot of work. Um, can you talk about uh, the role Canada played during this period of 1975 to 1985? Do you have a specific number of how many refugees uh, Canada took in? Yeah, so Canada was instrumental in terms of the resettlement of refugees from Southeast Asia. From 1975 to 1997, Canada resettled 210,000 Southeast Asian refugees, making it the longest and largest resettlement of non-Europeans to Canada. Mm. So this really changed the face of Canada and really implemented the uh, Multiculturalism Act. Uh, looking at Canada as being multicultural, this really uh, changed uh, changed that uh, in Canada. And uh, between 1979 and 1980, Canada resettled an unprecedented 60,049 Southeast Asian refugees in wow. 18 months. And so when I think about that, I just think it's remarkable what the Canadian government was able to do and the Canadian communities themselves who did the private sponsorship of refugees. Because today, according to UNHCR Global Mm. Trends, last year in 2023, the countries, all the countries in the world that were doing resettlement, resettled less than 60,000 refugees last year. So there, um, yeah, literally nothing. Yeah, right? and I mean, even resettlement. Even when we we are looking at resettlement in general, that is such a small percentage of the people we are helping. When you look at the total numbers of forcibly displaced people in the world today, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm presuming one of the goals of the Hearts of Freedom uh, exhibit is to educate youth today about historical events that mm-hmm. took place uh, in Southeast Asia in the 1960s. I mean, we're, we're, it's hard to think about, but like, it's more, it's four, it's mm-hmm. 30 and so almost 40 years yeah. ago. Um, do you think a lot of that history has been lost or forgotten? Like, do they know about the Cambodian genocide and the Vietnam mm-hmm. War and the Laotian mm-hmm. secret war? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think m- many of the students that I have at the university have no idea about the Southeast Asian refugees who came to Canada. And uh, some of them may have heard, you know, of the Vietnam War, but no one really talks about the Laos secret war Mm -hmm. just because it was a secret war for a long time and no one really acknowledged what was happening there, even though it's the most heavily bombed country in the world per capita. And uh, there are still unexploded ordinances in that country today. And so many of the students, um, I would ask them, do you talk about this in your social studies classes or in your other classes? And they say no, like they they haven't learned about this. And I think it, that's a big gap in, yeah. uh, in our Canadian history totally. because this movement uh, was instrumental uh, in terms of the number of people we resettled during that time and the different government policies and programs that were implemented during that time that continue to exist today, including the private sponsorship of refugee program, designated class, mm-hmm. and uh, and other kinds of programs. It's a big gap in, in general in, in mm-hmm. history. We were talking off air and I was saying, I was born in 74, mm-hmm. And I grew up listening to the radio and hearing about the Khmer Rouge and hearing about the fallout of uh, the fall of Saigon, which mm-hmm. is now Ho Chi Minh City. But at the time, I was too young to really understand mm-hmm. what was happening. But Southeast Asia was still, like in the late 70s, a big part of what was going mm-hmm. on in the world. It was super important. Yes. And uh, I teach a refugees and forced migration course at the university at uh, 
It was at Menno Simons College, Canadian Mennonite University at uh, University of Winnipeg. And I do talk about the Southeast Asian refugee movement uh, just because of my own work uh, in this. And it's been really great to be able to share these stories and uh, these different perspectives on the wars in Southeast Asia and, uh, and how different countries around the world were able to assist uh, during that time and uh, the importance of private sponsorship of refugee program, the importance of being compassionate, and uh, the importance of helping just totally, because there yeah. was a need out there. Mm-hmm. You know, they, uh, they, they realized, the Canadians realized that there was a need out there and they wanted to do something. And the people of Canada in 1986, uh, if, uh, if you recall, was awarded the UNHCR Nansen Medal for mm. our assistance to refugees. And that is pretty significant yeah. uh, in terms of, uh, of what uh, Canadians did. Mm, absolutely. <clears throat> the, exi- the exhibition is comprised of a variety of panels detailing the stories of refugees' journeys w- through mm. photographs and shared memories. It sounds like an awful lot of work. Um, can you go into a little bit of detail? Like, was it the five of you just who just went around and simply straight up collected oral mm-hmm. histories and then collected photographs? Like, how did that process work? Yeah, well, we had a team, uh, as I mentioned earlier, of uh, interviewers and camera people, community coordinators, and they uh, would assist us with this research. So the community coordinators in each city would provide us with uh, names of people who might be interested in being interviewed. Mm -hmm. And so that was really helpful in terms of making sure we get interviews across, across Canada. And uh, when we are looking at, uh, yeah, at this project, and once we were able to conduct all of these interviews, the researchers went through all the interviews, <laughs> uh, listened to them all, and uh, did the analysis and uh, the outcomes, uh, as uh, we mentioned in our website. The original outcome for this research project was to uh, create a website Mm-hmm. to uh, write a book. So we're working with McGill Queen's University Press on a book, a curriculum for high school and university students, and a film documentary, which mm-hmm. uh, we have done. And then on top of that, um, this was something ad- in addition to uh, to those. I thought, wouldn't it be great to create a museum exhibition <laughs> <laughs> and have it travel across Canada to the 10 cities where we conducted interviews and bring it back to the communities sure. and have them involved in celebrating uh, what, uh, what we have uh, have done with the, uh, with the project. And uh, so I got together a committee to work with me on this. I uh, asked two advisors from the Canadian Museum of History, uh, Laura Sankini, and from the Canadian Museum of Immigration, Emily Burton. Plus, I invited three representatives from the ethnic communities to be on this committee so that they can provide me with feedback as I'm working on uh, designing a museum exhibition. Uh, creating a museum exhibition. So that was uh, an amazing process because I've never created a museum exhibition before. (laughs) I'm an academic. I can write a book. I can write articles. But uh, creating a museum exhibition was something that was very different. But I think it's important to have this different kind uh, of dissemination of our research because some people might want to read a book but others prefer to walk through an exhibition mm. or to watch a film yeah. rather than reading an academic article. Mm. And uh, so it's a different way of disseminating our research. And I had, yeah, I had a great committee and people I worked with at the different museums and, and our overall designer, uh, Grant Murray in Halifax. And we were able then to create this uh, museum uh, exhibition from the interviews and the photos that they have provided us, mm. and the collections that have been donated to us really? by uh, the Canadian government or by Henry Neufeld, who uh, worked in Thailand uh, during that time and was an amateur photographer working with MCC. And uh, he was able to provide us with some of the photos that he had taken uh, with his camera. 
and we were able to uh, use all of these different photos to sure. create the museum exhibition. And of course, many of the photos that the former refugees provided us are old, right, from 30 years right, ago, yeah, 40 yeah. years ago. And, uh, and so we were able to use those photos for some of the smaller uh, photos that we needed for the exhibition, but some of the larger pieces, we needed good resolution. And so we had to go looking for some of those photos. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and scan and digitize them, I, I yes. would imagine. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the things I was thinking about is, in your research, did you ever come across conflicting interpretations of sim- similar historical events? Mm-hmm. Did, 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 that, did that ever ever happen? Yeah, I think in, in um, our research project, uh, looking at all the different stories, we realize that there are many shared experiences, but there are also different perspectives in terms right. of uh, their thoughts about certain things, just because we are individuals and uh, we may have different memories of that. Or if you're a child, my yeah, memory yeah. is going to be very different than my parents' memories because they sure, were sure. adults in their 20s when uh, when they left, whereas uh, whereas I was a young, uh, young child. And so so to bring all the pieces together was really interesting. So even with my own family story, I would talk to my mother and say, okay, you know, how, how would you describe what happened during this time? And then I said, well, I recall as a child, this and this happening, uh, is this correct? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, so it was, yeah, very, very interesting, right, to be able to hear all of these different stories and their recollections of uh, these uh, these stories. And it is their story, yeah, right? Yeah. This is what they experienced, totally. and they're going to describe to us how they experienced it. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we can um, share this in a way that reflects their stories in the way they see it. Yeah, seeing things happen through their eyes and yes, through their prism. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- one of the things uh, I was also thinking about is um, it must have been super interesting to gather the research, but did you find that talking to these people opened up old wounds? Yeah, I think for some people, um, they were very emotional in terms of sharing their stories. Many of the people we interviewed told us that this was the first time that they had shared their stories. And some of them haven't even shared their stories with their own children mm-hmm. and grandchildren. And, uh, and so it was very emotional for them. And you can see in some of the interviews we conducted, many of them had tears in their eyes and uh, their voices were wavering because of the memories mm-hmm. of what had happened to them. And those feelings right, come up again, even though it's been a number of years, when you recall some of these experiences, it can still be very emotional. And you can, uh, you can definitely, uh, definitely see that. Um, there are also some surprises in, in terms of um, how many of the interviewees were willing to share information, share their experiences. Some of them were very personal, but they were willing to share it. Yeah. And um, and that was amazing, right, that they felt comfortable enough to be able to share this with us and that they felt this was the right time now to share their stories. And uh, many of them want their children and those who have grandchildren to remember where their families came from. And uh, this is a way of helping them remember yeah. those stories. And getting, getting it documented. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a documentary, speaking of uh, documents, uh, that goes along uh, with the Hearts of Freedom exhibit. Can you talk about some of the things that the documentary mm-hmm. touches on? Yeah, so we have a documentary film that was produced by Sheila Petzold, a fr- former CBC executive producer, and she worked with us in creating uh, this, uh, this film. And again, it delves into their journeys to refugee camps and their experiences in uh, coming to Canada and what they are doing now. So you go through almost their whole life, you wow. know, since they uh, escaped from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia to their present lives here in Canada and what they're currently doing. And I think similar to the exhibition, one of the things we want to highlight as well is to highlight the successful stories of integration and what these communities are now contributing to Canada and the world. Absolutely. Uh, because yeah. many of them are now doctors, dentists, engineers, teachers, nurses, mm. uh, Canadian ambassadors, and uh, they are really contributing to Canada and the world in many, many ways. And I think that's an important story to tell rather than just hearing some of the negative stories in the media. Yeah. Um, but here are some positive stories, some successful stories of integration. And people who are really contributing to society. Mm. 
uh, uh, I was saying on, on, before I press the record button, I saw the video interview that you did. Mm-hmm. I have to ask, can people see that video interview at, at, the, at the presentation or no? At the, uh, pre- uh, at the exhibit. At the exhibit. So uh, what we have at Manitoba Museum right now is we have in Festival Hall a room dedicated to the Hearts of Freedom stories of Southeast Asian refugees. And so you have the exhibition panels in there. Right. And then off to the side, uh, right by the exhibition, they have created a room, a small theater, where the film is rolling on uh, uh, or is being screened on a rolling basis. So you can go and sit for 10 minutes after walking through the exhibition and see a few minutes of the film. Or if you're interested, you can actually sit there for the full 50 minutes or wait for the next, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, next start of the film and watch it. And I think I've had people who have written me emails afterwards and said they were so captivated by the uh, by the film that they sat and watched through it twice. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so it's really uh, amazing uh, that way. And then we are having an, uh, a film screening at Manitoba Museum on March 1st. Okay. 7 to 9 p.m., and it is open to the public. So if you go on the Manitoba Museum website under events, you will see Passage to Freedom, and you can reserve a ticket. It's a free event, but you will need to reserve a ticket. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, one of the things is, uh, is there anything that's been learned uh, by the Canadian government in regards to resettling refugees, specifically from mm-hmm. uh, the past experience of uh, dealing with, uh, with Southeast um, Asian mm-hmm. refugees? Yeah, I think uh, they have learned in terms of some of the settlement practices and programs that have been able to help refugees and newcomers adjust to living here in Canada. So uh, they have um, many more resources than they did back then in the 70s and uh, and 80s, when I think some of the information they had were just a few Vietnamese words, but nothing in Khmer and nothing in uh, Laotian. And, uh, and they just thought, well, maybe, you know, Southeast Asians, <laughs> we can just follow the, the same uh, guidelines. But the communities or the cultures are very different, right, between, right. Uh, between those different groups. And uh, also, I think in terms of being able to check up on uh, on people after they have landed here in Canada and are uh, starting to settle in here, uh, there are uh, services where they are asked, you know, how are things going? How are things going with your sponsors? Um, how are you adjusting? And I think those are really important because in my own family story, we kind of slipped through the cracks. No one came and checked up on us to see how we were doing and uh, whether we were experiencing hardship um, or or not. And I think uh, those are some of the things that they're doing, uh, doing much better and uh, offering more language classes mm-hmm. so that uh, people can learn English uh, or French. And even with that, we still have backlogs. When the Syrians came to Canada, some of them were waiting months or years to uh, enroll in a language class because they were all full. Yeah. Right, so there are still issues like that, and issues with credentials. Yeah. So if you were a doctor uh, back in whichever country, and you come here, uh, that isn't recognized. And how do we work at that? And how can we do uh, that process in a way that is uh, done more quickly? Yeah, one of the things I always think about is like we're constantly complaining about a shortage of doctors, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. yet. Yeah. There are doctors who are coming to Manitoba. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, so there, there's that side of things yeah. as well, right? Yeah, there was one person we uh, interviewed, Dr. Tree Hong. He was a dentist from Vietnam. When he applied to come to Canada to resettle in Canada, he had to denounce that he was a dentist so that he couldn't practice here right away. Um, or uh, you know, or uh, have his uh, his credentials, mm. and uh, he had to start from scratch. Mm. And he started from scratch, and uh, eventually built a successful dentistry business. So you can see the resilience of the people we interviewed and uh, the refugees, just being able to uh, escape and uh, and uh, and go through the refugee camp experiences and to resettle in a new country and settle here. Um, they had a lot of courage, strength, and resilience. Yeah, absolutely. Is is there one thing that the that your group is particularly proud of uh, w- with this with this exhibit? Like, if if the, if you could just put it out there in one sentence, mm-hmm. what would it be? I think what I'm really proud of, or what our group is, that we're able to now share 
what we have done with our communities across Canada. That has been really exciting for me in terms of touring the exhibition across Canada, mm. just reconnecting with uh, the Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian communities from Vancouver all the way to Halifax, connecting with the different sponsoring groups across Canada, connecting with newcomers, you know, some of the recent uh, refugees who have come to Canada, uh, connecting with institutions, organizations, government personnel. Mm. I think that has all been really, uh, really amazing and uh, and. Uh, redeveloping those relationships and reconnecting with with one another and sharing, you know, the important uh, period of our history and, and celebrating bring, that, bringing it to the forefront again, yeah. which is just yeah. so man, yeah, it's so important. Yeah. Oh man, Stephanie, this has just been absolutely amazing to talk to you. Your story and the Hearts of Freedom stories of Southeast Asian refugees exhibit sound like they're just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me today yeah. and stop by. Thank you. Maybe I can add a plug. Um, yeah, yeah. Besides March 1st event, yeah. we are celebrating the 45th anniversary of Mennonite Central Committee Canada signing the first master agreement with the federal government to privately sponsor refugees. Wow. So we're having a big celebration with MCC and Southeast Asian refugees at Canadian Mennonite University on March 3rd. Oh, and wow. uh, that is going to uh, take place at Marpet Commons between 4 and 7 p.m. And uh, so that's really exciting. And uh, we will continue to travel the museum exhibition across Canada. The next destination is Edmonton, Calgary. And I just got confirmation this week that the Senate of Canada is going to host the exhibition oh, the last two weeks in May. And then from there, we will continue with our tour across Canada. Amazing. Thanks again, Stephanie. This has just been so great and so enlightening. For our Classic 107 listeners, Hearts of Freedom Stories of Southeast Asian Refugees is at the Manitoba Museum. For more details, visit classic107.com or go to manitobamuseum.ca. Stephanie, again, thank you. Thank you.